Hi there, I'm Pastor Cliff Gleason, and I want to thank you for tuning in today to our worship service. Here at the Laconia Seventh-day Adventist Church, we worship Jesus Christ as our Creator, our Lord, our Savior, and our coming King. And we hope that you will enjoy this service with us, that you'll be inspired by the teaching and the music and every part of our service. So sit back and enjoy, and thank you for being with us today. Oh, you want to be on this side? Makes sense. We're already over here. Well, let's see. What do we have here today? This is a good thing for boys. What is it? A rope. Now, what can a rope do? Can a rope do anything? A rope can for a climb up. Yeah, you can climb up. If we put it up on something high, you can climb right up it. Or go down. Or go down. If you're up there, you could come down on the rope. What else? Hey, what about this? Look at this thing here. I got an idea. Here we go. It's a little dangerous when the pastor gets an idea. <laughs> Look at this. Here we go. Look at this. Could this pull? Could this rope pull that stand? You think it could? Yeah. It probably could. Okay. Now sit, sit down. Let's watch. Okay, rope. Pull the stand over there. Yeah. Come on, rope. Come on, rope. Rope. Pull the stand over there. Yeah, you, have to, you have to pull it. Oh, you mean I have to get a hold of it like this? The rope can't work by itself? No, oh, it's not that. living. Oh, it's not, not living. living. Okay. All right, let's, let's take and move this over here. Let's get rid of this part. Now... Okay, would you stand up over here for, to help with something? And then would you stand up over here? All right, you take this good strong part and you hold it with two hands. Got two hands? Good, hold it tight. Now you take this in, but wait a minute. Just two fingers. That's it, just two fingers like that. Okay, now pull, pull, pull your brother. <laughs> Just stand still. Oh, look at that. <laughs> All right, so now that's one thing. So one thing we learned is you have to hold tight on the rope, don't you? Yeah. If you hold with two fingers, you, even you, I can't even be, go ahead, pull hard, pull hard, pull, oh, see, even I can't do it. So, but wait a minute, now I got another idea. Here, come over here again. Now hold on with two hands strong. Come over closer, though. Hold in too strong, but, oh, you step, step back down here. Get ready to pull your brother. But wait a minute, I want you to take and on one foot, just one foot. Put one foot up in the air, put one foot up in the air. That's it, one foot up in the air, one foot up in the air. Now pull on him, pull on him, pull on him, pull, oh. <laughs> now go ahead back over there with two feet down, two feet down. Now pull your brother. Pull him, pull him. Oh, now it's a different story, isn't it? Okay, let go, let go. Thank you. I go Thank you. Sit down a moment. You see, this rope is a little bit like the Bible. It's a little bit like the Bible. Now, here's a big Bible right over here. And some of you, do you have Bibles at home? No. No Bibles at home? Can you think of any? No? Maybe on the phones. Maybe your, your parents have a Bible on the phone. Does, does Grammy or Grampy have a Bible? No. no? Well, we, let's ask Grampy. Grampy, do you have a Bible at home? Uh, well, mine's on computer. It's on computer. And does Grammy have a Bible at home? Sure. What color? Here's Daddy's Bible right here. That's an unfortunate. Oh, Daddy has a Bible. He's back there. Okay, now, a Bible, if a Bible sits over there, a Bible can't do much good for us. 
we have to take a get a hold of a Bible and we have to start reading it, studying it. And then just like when you hold on just two fingers, if you only hold on to the Bible and what it teaches with a little tiny bit of a hold on to it, it won't do much good. We have to get a good strong hold. And we have to have two feet down. And then when we're really holding on to what the Bible teaches and we're really enjoying it and loving it. Do you like hearing the stories in the Bible? Like stories about David? Do you ever hear about David killing Goliath? Or about Jonathan being thrown in jail? Not Jonathan, uh, Joseph. No. no, don't remember those stories. <laughs> How about Noah and the flood? No. And the ark? <laughs> no. no, no, never heard that yes. one. Yes. We have that book. You have that book. When we study the stories of the Bible and enjoy them, it's like two feet on the ground and holding on tight. And then it's amazing what the Bible can do. Thank you for listening to our story about the Bible today. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Proverbs. Book of Proverbs, chapter 3, reading verses 1 through 6 from the New King James Version. Proverbs 3, 1 through 6. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For a length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. And find favor in the sight of man and God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct your paths. The Lord add his blessing this morning as our pastor brings us his word. This passage in Proverbs chapter 3 uh, became dear to me uh, when I was first coming to the Lord. And so I'm glad to share it with you today. And even though it's directed to the young and I'm no longer young, at least in the eyes of some. Uh, <laughs> and many of us are no longer in that category of young. But there are young people here today and there are still years ahead of us as well. So we want to learn from God's word. Now here it says, uh, verse one, my son do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. We've been studying about the relationship of the law and the heart in sermons, in Sabbath school lessons, and Bible studies. And it's a good, good subject to look at. Another version says, store my commands in your heart. Store my commands in your heart. Now, where do we usually store commands? Usually it's in our minds, isn't it? If you are going to get your driver's license, what do you do? You study the, the laws and the things that are going to be on the test, right? You put it in your, in your head and ready to, uh, to pass that test. The mind is a good place for things. It's a place where we have reason and logic. But if we only have a, a, a sense, a relationship to God's law that's based out of reason, which we could, are God's laws reasonable? Yeah, they're very reasonable. And the more you look at that, I mean, it's a lot of reason. Is there logic to the laws of God? Yes, there is. I mean, God says, thou shalt not steal. If everybody in the world obeyed that one command, would the world be different? Sure, it would be different for hundreds of thousands of people in Texas and in Florida right now because they've left their homes and they are very vulnerable to looting. And if they knew that nobody would steal from their homes, wouldn't they be feeling better right now? They would. The whole world would be better if we just obeyed that one command. It's logical. But logic and reason can only lead to a motivation of obligation. 
of obligation. God wants our our relationship to his commands to not be one of obligation, but one of appreciation. He wants it to come from the heart. The heart is where we can have motivations of deep respect and love and admiration. And that's what God is looking for. But people will say, but I don't have any great heart experience. I don't feel anything wonderful about God and his instructions. I, I, it's, I don't have that. So what do we do? Well, the Bible gives us a plan for activating the heart. Activating the heart. What would that be? What scriptural principle can activate our heart so that we can feel something toward God and his instructions? Well, it's one word, praise. Praise activates the heart. Now, how do you praise? People say, well, I don't know how to praise God. I don't know how to thank him. I know how to ask for things. That's easy. I can ask for lots of things. And I can thank him for things that he's given me. But how do I praise him? Well, I'm not going to do a whole sermon on praise. Just go to Psalm, and you can make a note here, Psalm 91 through 106. Psalms 91 through 106. If you go through and read those, and I would ask you to do something more than read them, and it's good to read them because they are examples of how to praise God. But I do more. Take the words of the Psalms and pray those words up to God. You will be praising him. It'll give you, it'll give you an example, a, 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 an illustration and a, an exercise. That's the word I'm looking for. It'll give you an exercise in praise. And the more you exercise praise, guess what happens? the easier it becomes to praise him. And your heart will get what? Activated. Your heart of emotion toward God will be activated by praise. Now, of course, it's always good to invite the Holy Spirit to help you. You need the Holy Spirit to, to make this really happen. Because he'll take the words of the Bible, the words of praise, and he'll make them come alive. Now, we look at the news and we see all this stuff happening. And we know that there's a big revival attempt coming up in October down in Washington, D.C. And there's lots of other things happening that tell us that so many things that we've been studying in prophecy for decades are all lined up like dominoes ready to happen quick. This is a special time. But it's not so much a time to go back and study the prophecies. There is a place for that. But it's more a time to study the beauties of Jesus and to praise him for those beauties. Because we need to have a heart-to-heart -heart experience with him. A, a, a mental experience of knowing all the things of prophecy is not enough. It won't get us through. Knowing what to expect won't prepare us with the preparation we need because we need to have our hearts one to him day after day after day after day. And so if that hasn't been your experience yet, start right now and get on the evacuation route to leave earth and go to heaven. And remember, you've got to get started right away because the gas stations will run out of gas. I should say the oil stations will run out of oil. If you know the ten virgins parable, they're going to run out of oil. You've got to get your oil now. And that means heart-to-heart -heart experience with Jesus. Don't put it off. All right, let's, uh, let's keep going with verse 2. It says, For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. If you do, uh, so, you know, those of us who are a little older, do we still want some more long life ahead of us? We do, don't we? There's still some things we want to experience and people we want to enjoy and adventures that Jesus has for us. So we want that. 
Another version says, says this, if you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Isn't that good? Your life, how many people are, are in the world and they may even be rich like billionaires, but their life isn't satisfying. God wants it to be satisfying. Another version says, you'll have a long life lived full and well. Isn't that good too? Full and well. I'm thinking they're a life of adventure. Now, some people, they want a long life because they have a very long list. What's that list called? A bucket list. That's right. Some people want to go traveling, like to China or to uh, New Zealand or someplace. Other people want to, well, what, what are some of the things you've heard people put on their bucket list? All right, they want to jump out of an airplane. Oh, she crossed off something on her bucket list. That's right. I, I tell you, we were in, in Switzerland in the mountains and we saw people do that hang gliding stuff. Wow, does that look like fun. I mean, it was like a 45 minute ride to go d uh, down through the, the valleys there in that place. But wow. But you didn't see me doing it. <laughs> that's not quite on my bucket list. That's, that's on if I go insane, then I can do that. <laughs> If I, if I get Alzheimer's, then put me on the hand glider. Anyway, what's some other things do people put on their bucket list? Especially living here in New Hampshire, not far from Loudoun. They want to ride one of those race cars at 150 miles an hour, right? And do you know they have those times where they bring in these exotic cars and you can sign up and pay $300 or $400 or $500 and drive a Ferrari or a Lotus or a Lamborghini? I do. Don't <laughs> I've never done it, but I've thought about it. Now, people put these things on their bucket list, but basically, what do they all have in common? All those things, the ones we mentioned. self-focused. I want to feel how fast it goes. I want to enjoy seeing this or experiencing that. Self-focused, isn't it? It's self-focused. Do we have a satisfying life if we pursue those things? We don't. We don't. Now, if we take somebody with us and share it with them, that helps a little bit, doesn't it? That's makes it much better for sharing with someone. Yeah, but but when, we're, when we really want something satisfying, we do for others. Did you hear about the, the man down, he's either in Texas, uh, another part of Texas than where, than Houston, or he was in Louisiana or someplace. I didn't catch where he was. But he went out and bought a boat precisely to go rescue people. That's satisfying. That's an adventure that he'll never forget. That's the kind of thing God wants for us. A life of adventure that makes a difference for others. You folks have been doing that. You've been investing in young people going to Pine Tree Academy. You've been investing in kids to go to church school. You've been investing in helping the Washington Church and in helping people in South America and so on. That's a satisfying life. To know that people's lives in these different places are being changed because God is working through you. That's right. Reaching out to the community right here. People in need. Yes. Now let's go to verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Now that verse, that old King James Version takes on a whole new meaning in the 21st century. Write them on the what? The iPad of your heart. Right? The tablet. We have tablets. And it says, write them on there. Now, tablet's important to us. When we have a tablet, I know my wife has a tablet that, w that my daughter or son gave to her. And she uses that all the time, especially for some pictures of a certain little girl. 
And, I t- and then she used it for Facebook and she keeps in touch with friends and all kind, you know, all that stuff. And it's important to her. And this says, put God's instructions right there on an important place where you'll remember again and again. So it says, now, two things involved with this, putting it around our necks and on our tablet of our heart. It says, mercy and truth. Now, mercy is caring and understanding and encouraging. God does that to us, and then we can reflect it out and do that to others. And that's the, the people who are near us, the people who are farther away. In all kinds of ways, we can remember mercy. But then there's also truth. Now, some want to leave truth off. And the Bible says the, ru- the reason many people want to leave off truth is because there are some things that aren't in harmony with truth that they still like and they want to hold on to. There's some sins in their lives, if we want to put it bluntly. There's some sins in their lives they love too much to let go of. And it's easier to let go of truth than to let go of the sin. And he says here, the writer, Solomon says, don't forsake truth. Now we're in a culture that says, adapt the truth, just change it so it'll sound like what you like. But is that real truth? No. Let's not get into that. Now verse four says, so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Another version says, earn a reputation for living well in God's eyes and in the eyes of the people. Now this, the, the, the New King James, find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Does that remind you of a, another verse? And Jesus did what? Increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So when, I wonder, do you think he knew some uh, of Proverbs 3? Well, certainly, he studied the scriptures carefully, didn't he? And he lived it out. Now, what part of his life was that verse talking about? His youth, which was which from where to where, from when to when? No. Twelve to. Twelve to thirty. 12 to 30. Now, a lot of kids are real nice, compliant, obedient kids until they get to be about 13. I've seen it in the church school. You have the sweet little girl who just does everything that she's told and, you know, the teachers love having her in class. She gets to be in the eighth grade and all of a sudden this, the princess button goes on. And she feels like she's the, the queen of the classroom. She's got to tell everybody what to do and nobody knows as much as she does, you know. You know how that goes. But Jesus, in his teen years and in his 20s, was increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. How did he do that? How do you picture Jesus increasing that way in his teens and youth years? Serving, what way did he serve? Any way you could find, but let's think of some examples that you might picture. Yeah, that's right. So he was ready to serve the father. Uh, in what way did he serve the father when he was a teen? I'm to his heavenly father, is what you're speaking of. What way do you suppose he served his heavenly father as a teen? Okay, the Bible says he went to the synagogue on Sabbath. And so that was his custom. All right, taught, asked questions, answered questions, yes? Uh, Steve? Uh, Jesus, that I saw a few years ago, they portrayed him um, actually carrying the pack of a soldier, that extra mile. Oh, like do you think he practiced what he preached? Yeah, that's a, that's, and that was, you know. I never it, thought of that. That's a good one. Yeah, everything he said like that, he probably did it. Who else did he serve pra- in practical terms? <coughs> oh, in the carpenter shop doing what? Whatever was necessary to be done in building, cutting, cleaning. Cutting, cleaning, sweeping up. <coughs> Whatever he was told. What, what, where else? Who else did he help? You said parents. So who's the other parent? His mother. Yeah. And what, what could he have done for her? 
Pardon? Run errands. For Run errands, yes. Carry water. Carry water. Peel potatoes. Peel potatoes. Sure. All these kinds of things. Very practical, easy things that teenagers naturally love to do. <laughs> Is that right? Without being asked. Sure, wouldn't that be wonderful? I mean, I'm sure you all did that. I remember we, were, we had to take turns doing the dishes. And it took, uh, when it was our turn, of course, first of all, we argued whether it was our turn. You have to do that. And then it would take us an hour and a half to do dishes that should have taken about 10 to 12 minutes because we would do one dish and then peek around the corner and watch some TV and then come back because we, aren't you doing those dishes? And so we'd have to come back, do one more dish. It took, it took forever because we didn't really want to do it. But Jesus was increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor of God and man. Do you suppose there are any bullies in his town? Where did he grow up? Yeah, the capital of bullies, apparently, from what they say. So if you've got bullies, what else do you have? Victims. What would Jesus do? Can you picture him? What would he do? He'd stand up. Something else? Protect. And after the, if he came after they'd been victimized? Console, comfort, encourage, befriend. Be a friend to the friendless. And were all the people in Nazareth young? No, who else was there? Older people, people that had some problem getting around, people that had problem seeing. What would Jesus do? He was increasing in favor with God and man and increasing in the favor of those older people who needed help because he would go out of his way to help them. Were there needy people who didn't have enough to eat? So what would he do? He would share his meals. It wasn't just the little boy who shared the meal to Jesus when he fed the 5,000. Jesus was once the little boy who shared his meal with the neighbors. So Jesus did all of this in a hard place to be good. How did he do it? How did he do it? Well, he was God, came natural. Is that right? What did he take on himself as God? He took on himself what? Humanity. The sinful humanity that we have to deal with, that wants to protect ourselves and our self-interests more than somebody else. So then how did he overcome that? He depended on the Father. That's why when the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was so powerful because he had been depending on the closeness of the Father from earliest years. And that was his habit. Wouldn't that be wonderful for us to be able to say, that we could depend on the Lord as much as Jesus did. But that's an experience that God wants for us. And it goes back to the rope in our children's story. What was the rope representing? The Bible. And what do you have to have? You have to have a good hold and two feet on the ground. A strong stance. So you've got to really get a hold of what God intends in the Bible. Not just as a list of instructions, but as the story about himself. Know him. All right, well, enough preaching on that verse. Let's go to verse five. Trust in the Lord with how much? With all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. We used to have a, a little plaque on our refrigerator. It said, ask a teenager while they still know everything. Another version says, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Boy, I've fallen into that trap. 
That's why I have duct tape and, and coat hangers in my car. <laughs> but I, I learned. I did learn uh, recently because when my, I pushed the button for my driver window to come down. You know, it's electric, so I pushed the button and it would come down. It came down fine. Then I pushed it up for going up and it would go up and then I'd let go and it would come down. Not fall down, but the motor would pull it down. So I push it to go up and it would go up and I'd, put, I'd let go and it would come down again. And so on and so on. And so I talked to uh, Steve and Steve said, oh, well, he was right there when it happened, actually. And uh, he said, oh, Jay had a problem with something in his car door and he figured out how to get to it and pull it all apart and and get it fixed. And so when we got back, I went to Jay because I wasn't going to, what does it say here? Don't try to figure out everything on your own. So I thought, well, if Jay had had success, we'll go to him. So I went to him. He said, well, I don't know about your car. You have to go to YouTube. That's what I did. He said, I went to YouTube. I put in my car and how to get into the door, and it showed. And so I went home, and I put on YouTube, and it showed me how to pull the panels off the door and how to get at the switch. And the, the person who did the YouTube video d w did not have the exact same problem as I had. So... I had to figure out some things that weren't on there. And thankfully, as I prayed about it, the Lord helped me. And so the, the thing got fixed anyway. But too often I have tried to just do it on my own. And how many things do we do that in the spiritual life? Now the Holy Spirit is ready to be our teacher, to be our instructor, to be our biblical YouTube instructor. And he's willing to inspire questions and then to lead us and to teach us into the right thing. Because Jesus told about it in John 16. And if you want to open your Bible to John 16, verse 12, I'm going to read it in, let's see, oh, I didn't, in the contemporary English version. John 16, verse 12. Jesus is talking to the disciples here. He says, I have much more to say to you, but right now it would be more than you could understand. The, the Spirit shows what is true and will come and guide you into the full truth. The Spirit doesn't speak on his own. He will tell you only what he has heard from me. And he will let you know what is going to happen. The Spirit will bring glory to me by taking my message and telling it to you. So you have an instructor and it's the Spirit and he's ready to help you. You just have to ask. Now, verse 6, the last verse. In all your ways, acknowledge him, acknowledge God, and he shall direct your paths. I like this other version. Uh, I think it's the New Living Translation. It says, listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Boy, that's hitting me between the eyes. Listen for God's voice in everything you do. That means you've got to stop, doesn't it? You've got to stop. And you've got to tune your ears to God's voice. Don't assume that you know it all. Trusting God is more, uh, trusting God more than yourself is a lifelong challenge. But we may not have a lifelong ahead of us. Things may be short. This generation may have to learn lessons that other generations had more time to learn. Now, then we need a good example of how to learn this lesson quickly. Or if you're young, young. And the, one of the best examples of a young person who did this well is none other than Mary, the mother of Jesus.
You know the story there in Luke chapter 1, how the angel came and said, Now Mary, you're the chosen one. You're going to be the mother of the Messiah. Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. You're going to have a child. His name will be called Emmanuel and so on. And she looked at him with wide eyes and said, How can this be? I don't know a man. I can't have any children. And the angel had to explain, No, no, this is something special that God is going to do. And then what was her response? She said, let it be unto your handmaiden as you have said. In other words, let God's plan be my plan. Now, was that her plan before then? It wasn't. She had the plan to just get married to Joseph, have a nice home, a nice place with a husband who believes in God, and they could raise their children to know the Lord, and life would be pretty calm and pretty ordinary, uh, except it would certainly be a faith-filled home. But now the angel comes along and says, oh no, it's not going to be that way. You're going to have a child that people will think is out of wedlock and you'll be having people with strange questions and, and Jesus is going to have to go through trouble and your own heart is going to be pierced like with a, with a uh, sword, a spear. And so she said, Len, let God's plan be my plan. I will be done. She was saying, I would rather do what God wants me to do than to do what I want to do. Now, how many young people make that choice? How many of us old people make that choice? And how many make choices that are different and cause them all kinds of trouble? But Mary did. She chose God's plan. And what resulted? How many people in the world know about Mary? Really? I mean, how many? It's, it's astounding. Even the Muslim people, they don't know much about Jesus, but they know about Mary. She has encouraged young people for over 2,000 years. Now, other people have learned similar lessons. Young Joseph, he learned to trust the Lord young. And David did, and Daniel, and Samuel, and Jeremiah, and John the Baptist, and John the Beloved, and Timothy. We could go on. They dedicated their lives to choosing God's plan. Now, it was 50 years ago, I was a teenager, and we had evangelistic meetings. And my family members and myself responded. I was baptized. I was learning soon about this Proverbs thing and I thought wow this makes so much sense I already see that when I take care of things I mess up and I lead to all kinds of trouble but if I could just trust God all the time now in those 50 years as I've sought God's plan at least some of the time I'm so happy to say that God has been faithful all the time and he's kept me out of a lot of trouble. Now, I wish I could say that I had been faithful to him the whole time and trusted him first all the time. But I've gotten into my share of troubles and God's protected me even from some of that foolishness and the results that have come. And then he's led me into some amazing adventures, very fulfilling things that, that I never expected things I couldn't have dreamed about. So those of you who are still young, let me tell you, let me encourage you that God will do the same for you and more. And you older folks, it's not too late to trust God. It's not too late to choose that his plan will be your plan. Think about Moses, Abraham, Nicodemus. They were older and God used them. He had plans for them. And he used them. And it was for glory. At every age of life, it is always best to trust God more. More than yourselves. Because God is good. When? All the time. And all the time, God is good. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, this, uh, this testimony given by Solomon reminds us that you are faithful 
that as we put anything in your hands, but especially ourselves, not just our tithe or our houses or our cars or something else or even our talents, but ourselves, our hearts, as we put our hearts in your hands, you are faithful. You will guard us and protect us. You will grow us and stretch us. You'll give us adventures and you'll fulfill us in helping others, in being a blessing. And all the experiences that we will have with you because you are good all the time. And we praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we take our hymnals and we... Once again, I want to thank you for coming and worshiping with us through the media. And we're glad that you were able to enjoy this particular service. But we're hoping one day will come when soon you'll be able to come right to our facility. We're here at 241 Province Street in Laconia. And our services are on Saturday mornings at 11 o'clock for the worship service. 9.30 if you want to come earlier for the Bible study. You're always welcome. We'd love to have you come. And there's a special thing that happens on the second Saturday of every month. That's our fellowship meal. And we'd love to you, for you to be able to be with us and to stay afterwards and enjoy the lunch with us. Now, you may also be inspired to want to study the Bible some more. And we do have different Bible study aids. We can provide something for you to study through the mail or we can come to your home, or we can arrange a small group study here at the church. So be in contact with us, and we will be able to set up something that will meet your needs as best we can. Thank you again, and we look forward to meeting you. God bless you in every way.